want to introduce our speaker. Uh, we have uh, a wonderful arrangement of uh, when I survey that will immediately follow my introduction. Then our speaker will come up. Uh, in fact, Daniel G. arranged this uh, great standard hymn. But Mark Sargent, our provost, this is his first uh, chance to uh, speak uh, to us in chapel here. And I am so grateful for Mark being here. Mark uh, received his undergraduate education at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara went on and did his master's and PhDs at Claremont Graduate School. He has, he has a doctorate in, in literature, he specialized in history, uh, in film, and in writing and education. He's been, a pro, he's been an academic officer at Biola, at Spring Arbor, and now after uh, 16 years, I think, at Gordon, uh, he's back at Westmont, where his wife graduated and two of his children. Mark, uh, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, and we are excited to hear what you have to say to us this morning. So the Lord bless you, and uh, we're expectant. But uh, we'll continue our worship, just uh, a chance to hear something beautiful and to meditate on these uh, extraordinary words. Wow, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, orchestra. Uh, what a wonderful way to start our service uh, this morning. I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, how many of you are looking forward to your four-day weekend? Mm. Uh, I want to thank you for being here because I know some of your friends have actually made it a five-day weekend. Mm. And in fact, I got to thinking, maybe it should be a five-day weekend. Let's look at it this way. You get two days. You get Saturday and Sunday. And you get one day off for President Lincoln, and one day off for President Washington, and shouldn't we have a day off for President Beebe? Yeah. I mean, anybody that dances with instep at the President's Ball deserves a, a day in his honor. He, he probably needs a day to recover, right? <laughs> uh, when Ben Patterson asked me to speak this morning, he said, speak from the heart. Uh, and I, what I'd like to do today is to tell you about two worship services that took place back to back in my life that have been important to me. And my, my comments this morning are going to talk about split seconds as well as many millennia. I'll try to be shorter than that. Yeah. About five years ago, uh, I was in my office in Massachusetts on a very cold January day. And I was interviewing a, uh, an outstanding candidate for a chemistry position. Uh, she had an expertise in chemistry as well as physics and was particularly interested in the measurement of time. Uh, and she was explaining to me different tools for measuring attoseconds. Uh, she could measure three or four hundred attoseconds. Now, let me give you a sense of proportion. Three hundred attoseconds is to one second, as one second is to a million years. Uh, beyond my mind to comprehend the precision that was necessary to do that. But it was in the midst of that interview that I got a phone call that in its own split second or two changed my life. It's called from my brother Brad out in California to tell me that my mother's aneurysm had burst. And in a split second, you process a lot of things. I realized that she had hours, not days to live. I realized that she would be unconscious, and I would never have that chance to say goodbye, to settle things, express things that you always hope to say before the end. Uh, I realized I needed to get out to California as quickly as possible. In fact, my wife Arlene got me tickets. I was on an airplane in three hours, but my mom had passed before I got to the airport. My brother Jim, another brother who some of you met when he spoke in the fall, picked me up at the airport, and we immediately went into the process of making decisions for my dad, who was very frail. And it reached a point in his own health that he was incapable of making any plans. The pastors that had been close to them had passed away or had moved. And so my brother Jim and I decided that we were going to do the service ourselves. We involved our, our children. They read scripture or shared remembrances. We sang hymns that were important to my parents. Uh, we had a small service for their friends in an annex of the major sanctuary of the large church where they attended. 
In many ways, it was just what my mother would have wanted. See, mom and dad had what we would call a fairly low church sensibility, uh, a church where the people were very involved uh, as equals in running the church. And my parents really believed that Sunday school was the heart of church. My mom was a flannel graph expert. Anyone know a flannel graph? <laughs> I didn't know whether that, uh, that still existed in some churches. She was a flannel graph expert. My dad used to make time machines out of old refrigerator boxes for vacation Bible school. Uh, we had memory verses and badges and, and all of that. Um, and in many ways, doing the service ourselves was staying close to our roots. My parents actually helped build the church. Uh, it was a time where the church had a contractor in the church, and the church built. I remember as a young boy going out and um, helping sweep up the nails as some of the older people in the church did the framing. Uh, my father did tile work. I remember mixing his cement uh, so we could put up tile, the linoleum down on the church floors, uh, the roofing on the church, all done by the people in the church. So doing it on our own fit mom and dad. And there was a shared sense with my brothers and I of, of a sense of loyalty to our roots, a sense of community, a shared struggle to find the words on that occasion that were authentic, that were from the heart. We walked us alongside each other with a sense of duty and grief, uh, although, to be honest, there was a little bit of denial. We're both administrators. I'm a provost. Jim's a superintendent of schools. We poured ourselves into the planning in many ways as a, a means of coping with grief. On the night of my mother's memorial service, I was actually on a red-eye flight back across the country to the East Coast because I had to lead some national meetings in Washington, D.C. My wife, Arlene, and my son, Bradford, who was actually studying that semester in Washington, D.C., would join me in a day. It was frigid. It was 15 degrees. The wind chill was below zero. It was about as cold as I'd been in Washington, D.C. And on a Sunday morning, about three days after my mom's memorial service, we took a taxi to the National Cathedral uh, in Washington, D.C. Large, neo-Gothic cathedral built in the last 50 years. Uh, perched on a hill overlooking the Potomac, very signature location in the city of Washington, D.C. If you've been to the National Cathedral, you'll know that it, it celebrates the states. There are state flags everywhere. There are windows, stained glass windows in honor of states. And the service on that Sunday was a very traditional, an Episcopal church, Episcopal service, fairly high church. So we walked in, they were practicing the choral music, Latin anthems for the day. Ministers were in robes, liturgical readings, strong organ. And for me, there was this deep sense of relief and release. After days of motion, planning a service, responsibility, drained emotions, you felt like you were pulled into something bigger and greater than yourself. And when they got to the point where the audience stood, the congregation stood to recite the Lord's Prayer, I had to fight back tears. I've said the Lord's Prayer many times. It's familiar. It's almost routine. I know many of you have felt that way too. Sometimes we do it in almost a mindless way. But on that occasion, there was now this deep sense of belonging to something greater than the moment that we were in. The Lord's Prayer has a wide tradition. It spreads across many nations. Um, the image which behind me is of the Church of the Paternoster in Jerusalem, in which the language, uh, the Lord's Prayer is represented in multiple languages. Uh, it's also a deep tradition. It goes back to millennia, and in some ways before. Sometimes I'm asked by students to explain why is it that I'm drawn to liturgy or why is it occasionally when faculty are asked to, to pray that they read their prayer. Sometimes there's a sense of like, is that from the heart? Is that authentic? In many ways, I see prayer like poetry. Lots of ways of defining poetry. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the romantic poet, gave one of my favorite definitions. He said, poetry is simply the best words in the best order. And I think sometimes prayer can be the best words in the best order. There are times when I enter church with a kind of 
inarticulateness. To be honest, sometimes I don't want to be there. Sometimes I come out of a sense of duty. Sometimes there's an emotional sense of being bare and empty. To be asked to say something from my heart at that time, it's difficult. I need the language of others. I need words that have deep resonance, that have layers and texture and meaning. Something beautiful, well-crafted, some of the best words in the best order. There's one experience for me that's been significant, served as a metaphor for me as I've thought about this balance of living in the moment and understanding history, which in many ways is about what worship is about, coming together for a special moment, but being aware of a greater heritage. It's also what the Christian liberal arts can be about. And this moment took place about 20-some years ago. My wife Arlene and I and our son Bradford, who was one year old at the time, our other children had not been born, went to the Grand Canyon. And we did what many tourists do at the Grand Canyon. We got up before dawn and we went to the edge of the Grand Canyon to see the sunrise. The pre-dawn pre ritual, is, it's actually something that the Native Americans used to do. As we stood there, very cold, at the edge of the gorge, out at the edge of the big canyon, uh, the winds whipping unabated across the, uh, the perimeter, you could feel more than you could see the great chasm before you. It was dark. There were vague profiles. The moon that day was a, a thin moon. It was very thin light. And then the light broke. And you began to see the silhouette of the distant hills, ridges in the distance. And suddenly the history and the strata of erosion came into view. Bright burgundy and ochre tones, bronze, sometimes ashen white, touch of green here and there. It's intimidating sometimes. We came for that one spectacular moment and then you're standing before millions of years. Gives you a sense of the greatness of God. It gives you a sense, in many ways, of how small we are in the big scope of things. In many ways, it's been a metaphor for prayer. Prayer is an appeal for divine light in the midst of the great landscape of history. And sometimes what the best prayers do, what the best worship does, is to bring with the Holy Spirit that light into our life to illuminate a much greater panorama beyond our particular moment. Sometimes worship illuminates the best words. That moment in the cathedral led me to explore many layers in the Lord's Prayer that had been so moving for me in the National Cathedral. As many of you know, the Lord's Prayer appears twice in the Gospels, once in Luke, uh, once in Matthew. It's a Matthew text that's most commonly read and recited. But that experience of the prayer that day drove me to, to want to know more about it, to understand its history. Uh, if you've studied the prayer before, you know that there are scholars that think that when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he drew on the Jewish precedents for this prayer. The Kaddish, the Jewish tradition, it's interesting, there's even an element of similarity between the Kaddish and my own grief that I was experiencing in the National Cathedral because there is a mourner's Kaddish. Mourner's Kaddish reads something like this. May his name be exalted, sanctified is his name. May he establish his kingdom. Words that sound a great deal like the words the Lord taught in what we call the Lord's Prayer. The tradition was that at a time of deep grief, when you don't know some of the answers, you exalt the name of the Lord. And you follow in the tradition of those who have come before you, who have exalted the Lord through grief, and have come out of it with greater strength and greater hope. That day in the cathedral, the part of the prayer that was particularly moving to me was the doxology the end of the prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It's actually, those words do not appear in some of the earliest manuscripts 
of the Lord's Prayer, some of the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament, what you see happening is that those words begin to appear in later manuscripts because they were a part of Christian worship. You see it in the Didache, a word means teaching, often attributed to the apostles, a very significant text in the early part of the first century where the Lord's, they recommend that the Lord's Prayer is read three times a day and recited. So when we read the prayer, in many ways, we're hearing echoes of the Jewish tradition that Christ evoked when he taught his disciples to pray. You're also hearing echoes of the language and the doxology used by his followers to recite his name. Some of the best words. And sometimes some of the best words are the only words. I read the story of a Vietnam War chaplain who saw incredible suffering and grief. And sometimes there were no words to say, but he would gather some of the surviving troops after a time of devastation and loss, where they had lost com colleagues and uh, fellow soldiers. And he said they would always begin with the Lord's Prayer because we needed to start somewhere that would give us words. I was in Kenya about 10 years ago when there was a coup in the Congo. It was at a Christian university there. We were in a worship service. There were six students from the Congo in that service. They could not contact their families. They did not know whether their families were alive or dead. The minister brought them to the front of the chapel. And this whole group of people in the church from many African nations said the Lord's Prayer as support, comfort, and petition for those in the Congo. When you think about worship, we come to seek his presence, the bursting through of that light through the Holy Spirit, the kind of filling that I felt that day in the National Cathedral. But we're also listening for the deeper resonances. Because sometimes when we come in and simply hear the words, the words of scripture, the words of familiar prayers over again, you may be storing those words for a day, it really matters. And that was true for me, uh, three days after my mother passed. We returned to the Grand Canyon nearly two decades later. Bradford was in college. We went to the North Rim this time. Sometimes it's not often understood is that the Grand Canyon is actually high country. We think of you're looking down into the depths of the earth. But the Grand Canyon was once a, a lake floor or an ocean floor. It's full of aquatic fossils, but then a great swelling of the earth formed by the merging of continental plates lifted the soil and then through time, many millennia, the rivers carved that great tapestry. But it's high country. And you, you're reminded of that sometimes when you're standing at the rim of the Grand Canyon and you're looking down and what you see are the birds, the birds that you're used to seeing overhead, but the birds that are flying uh, in, in the cavernous. And that day we could see birds, we could see hawks and sparrows, we even found one eagle that was flying, finding a perch uh, down amongst, amongst the cavern below us. The eagle in the National Cathedral and in many cathedrals is a symbol of the Gospels. It's often a symbol of the Gospel of John. John is the Gospel that aspires to great philosophical heights. You know the beginning of it. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It presents Jesus, presents the Christ in strong philosophical terms, and as a result, it's been seen as a gospel that soars, and so it's been equated with the eagle. One of the reasons why we have eagles on the lecterns that are used in churches. Every once in a while, someone with a candlestick and an eagle in formal services will carry that, can that eagle down into the aisle, even as the pastor or minister follows to read the gospel. The gospel is read among the people. It reminds me of that moment. The eagle soaring to great heights. But the eagle descending. And isn't exactly that what we pray for? That in our worship, we'll have a sense that we can soar with God. But God will descend to dwell among us. And that descent sometimes comes 
when we remember the words that have been important not only in my life, but have been important for centuries. So I ask you today to close our service with me by praying with me, quietly or pray with me verbally. Please pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Have a wonderful four-day holiday. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.